So I'm Jim, I work uh, for Near Technology, the guys uh, behind the Near4j database. And uh, today I'm not actually going to talk too much about Near4j. Uh, I'm going to talk about graph data. And it's, it's a weird thing, right? So, anyway, uh, there's, there's going to be an excellent uh, hands on uh, session this afternoon using Near4j. And I spent most of my time in the guts of Near4j uh, doing low level bit twiddling, uh, as my wife describes it. Uh, um, but what's really amazing. <coughs> Uh, about a year ago, uh, I saw a chap called James Fowler give a talk about, uh, about health uh, and health informatics. And James uh, was using graphs, uh, connected data structures, to map pathogens uh, like obesity, for example. And he was coming up with some really crazy, interesting, counterintuitive results by using graph theory to be uh, applied to a data set to find out how obesity spreads. For what it's worth, the weird thing is, if you want your kids' friends to be thin, you should be thin. Because your obesity doesn't directly affect your kids. Weird! And I was like, wait a minute, this is interesting. Uh, this is fascinating stuff, because I thought all the clever stuff in graph technology was domain, model, affinity, and then the stuff that I do with my team, which is actually writing databases, right? That's proper, manly, nerd stuff, if that's not too much of it, an oxymoron. Uh, just, um, you know what I mean? It's like proper geeky stuff. But then when I heard Jim speak, I, he reminded me about just how awesome informatics is, and how amazing the graph, the humble graph is for finding out about what's going on in the world. I thought, okay, I've got to get more into this. So um, I took a slight detour from my, my normal day job. I started reading up on graph theory and remembering all of those graph algorithms that we forgot from university. Yeah, uh, the ones that you kind of slept through with the boring old professor using a chalkboard. Remember that guy? Oh boy. Uh, but anyway, it turns out there's a grown up. These things are fascinating. And I want to share with you today some of the kind of fascinating stuff that's happening in, in the world of graphs. Uh, and then, you know, by, by implication, graph databases. So I want to talk, I'm, I'm a bit of a rover. <laughs> Got to get my 10,000 steps in. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about imprisoned data. So it's a data conference, there's a lot of data stuff going on. And I want to talk about uh, uh, accessing data. And then I want to talk about uh, graph models, the various graph models that uh, are becoming prevalent today. And then actually jump into a bit of graph theory. Um, don't worry, there won't be too much maths. Yes, it is a plural people. <laughs> um, so that's that English domain expertise thing going on again. Uh, that joke's going to wear thin about 30 seconds from now, but it's going to go through the trough of disillusionment, and about 10 minutes from now it's going to be funny again. Mark my words. So we're going to do some graph theory uh, for predictive analysis. So we're going to look at some data and predict how it might evolve. And we're going to see that graph theory is like absolutely like amazing for doing predictions on data. And then we're going to look at it round, and we're going to look at graph pattern matching, so we retrospective analysis in near real time on data for fun and profit. And then I'll bring it uh, uh, sort of tied into some interesting things that have happened more recently around Facebook graph search, and then free stuff. Yeah. Like, that's such a cheap thing to do, isn't it? At the end, you'll get free stuff. If you don't walk out like this dude to the Boeing <laughs> talk. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to find that Boeing guy and find out what's so fascinating in his talk that he <laughs> pre heckled me and then walk out. Okay, so here we've been here, right? This, this is, this is not, not what we're doing anymore. We've all been <coughs> in that situation where you've done the upside down, left, outer, upper join through 17 tables just to change this flag from true to false, right? We're not in this situation anymore. We have alternative data models, and this conference really embodies the spirit of those alternative data models that are the best fit for the system you're building. And in, in, that, in the umbrella of NoSQL, I was just in Promote's talk, and it, it, he calls this out very well. He says that we have the notion of aggregate databases composed of the key value stores, uh, the column stores, uh, and the document stores. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's cute, isn't it? Uh, of course, you know, my little geek pun here is, people argue, you've got, you got Adrian uh, Cockcroft here, who will tell you, you know, Cassandra is the most scalable column store, yada, yada, blah, blah. This is the most scalable column store, people. This is the British Museum of columns. It's where we store stuff that we stole. And we need to expand it to build a new wing, right? I mean, that's horizontal scale for you. <laughs> now we've got like the Greek stuff, we've got like yeah, the Egyptian stuff. It's amazing. Uh, and it's free to get in, right? Yeah. It's all stolen, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's why we have the columns, right? That's why we have security guards. Uh, it's to stop people reverse stealing, which kind of just seems a bit calm. Anyway. Don't get me going down that track, right? Meant to be serious today. One of my colleagues is in the room, he's going to report that to my boss if I don't like uh, enthuse you. Uh, so, 
So we've got these things called ambient databases, and uh, Promote and, and his uh, writing partner, Martin Fowler, uh, wrote about ambient databases, but they're good when the way that you store data and the way you query it is a find. That is, when you store aggregates and retrieve aggregates, everything is, goes swimmingly. But when you want to chop that data, when you want to look at it in different dimensions, then you have to often resort to external means to, uh, to, uh, to do that kind of chopping and, and mashing of data for you. Which is why aggregate databases tend to speak so prevalently about processing techniques like MapReduce. That you, you often couple your aggregate data store with some external processing like Apache Hadoop. That's a fine, fine thing, right? Uh, but it's a bit like the kind of prison break pattern, uh, where your data's happy in the database, uh, and then suddenly you kind of bust it out of prison, run it through the do, and then get some, uh, get some insight into your data, and then maybe stick it back in. And again, that's a fine thing to do. A do, and, and it will give you a high throughput, uh, right? because it's typically a very amenable to parallelism, but similarly, it will be at relatively high latency. And this is fine, right? This is where we come from. We come to a situation where these kind of data stores, these kind of data processing techniques grew up where the biggest problem we had in data was size and growth. So a whole NoSQL thing really kind of you know, uh, got its head of steam because we were worried that data was getting larger and larger and that was going to negatively impact the kind of traditional relational databases that we we're all used to using. And that really is still a problem, right? Data is growing and growing and growing. We're storing and processing each year more data than we ever had before. But that's not the only axis along which data complexity is growing. You know, complexity is not simply a function of size or churn or any of that stuff, you know, any of the 17 Vs of data that you we've know, got that will give you. Uh, you know, data complexity is also a function of uniformity. How uniform or disuniform, I've just let myself down with English there, haven't I? I don't actually know the opposite of uniform in English. So if anyone knows that word and wants to tell me offline, that would be lovely. Uh, or indeed, how connected that data is. Because what, 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 what the aggregate model sort of falls flat, as Pramod mentioned in his session previously, is that there's no notion of connectivity between records. It's something you have to kind of, by convention, make up yourself and manage for yourself. But actually, data is connected. Right? Habitually, data is connected. When I go and see my medical practitioner, free at the point of charge, by the way, uh, ooh, that puts it Ah, come on. I tease because I love. No, I'm not in this state, though, right? I mean, you guys are all kind of basically safe, right? The strips around the edges are safe for me to make these jokes, right? It's just a weird bit in the middle with guns that I can't make these jokes. Oh, blimey. It's a very mistake to uh, so I did have a problem, I, I was doing a road trip uh, last year uh, through uh, some of the flyover states, they're lovely, beautiful places. I was having a lovely time in a pub with a couple of like, uh, guys with funny hats and stuff. And they asked me, like, do you ride horses? I was like, no, don't be daft. If God meant us to ride horses, he'd exist. <laughs> Suddenly, not so many friends in that pub. Um, anyway, um, back on data. <laughs> so, we've got this. And I'm slightly safe with data, right? We've got to reach this, this fork in the road, if you like. It's kind of really uh, interesting bifurcation points in, in kind of the history of data management. And the, the, path, the path ahead of us is really very distinct. Uh, we can go left. We can denormalize data into aggregates. And then we uh, live in a world where denormalized data, keys and values, or, or common families, or documents, uh, are stored as independent atomic units of data in our database. Simple data model, but then we have to use some processing technique in order to gain insight. Right? So we're going to take that data, we're going to run it through our processing infrastructure, and gain insight that way. The right fork in the road um, takes us to a completely different model. It takes us to uh, uh, a model, uh, uh, sorry, a completely different path where we have a richer data model, where we have a very uh, query centric method. And it's weird, right? Because this, this right fork in the road is shared by graph databases and relational databases, where you, where you build a high fidelity model and you ask questions of that model and it gives you insight that way. You tend to have at least in the case of graph databases, there is much more about expressive power and doing traversals over a linked data structure than it is about ripping data out, putting it through your Hadoop sausage machine and kind of brute forcing uh, inside that way. And so this is the fork in the road that we're going to take uh, in this session. This is the world in which we live. In fact, this is the world in which I live. Um, I live here kind of, let's think, yeah, back there. Uh, it's kind of, if, if, if this was like a map of stabbings, 
this would be much more prevalent. So I live in the stabby part of London. <laughs> Uh, thank Christ we don't have handguns, right? I mean, at least someone's got to choke you with a knife. It's, uh, uh, so this is the stabbing part of London, uh, where I live. Uh, here is London Bridge Station, which is where the Neo, uh, Neo for J office is in London. And up here is, is Paddington Station. Now, some of you guys might have been through Paddington Station. It's, it's where we get the link out to Heathrow Airport. So if you guys knew nothing about London, or London's uh, tube network, or graphs, or anything, I bet I could still ask this question of you, and you'd give me an answer. What's the best way for me to get from Paddington Station, which is connected to Heathrow Airport uh, by a fast train, uh, to uh, London Bridge? And what would you do? You say, well, okay, now here's Paddington, and there's this green and yellow line, so I will go down here, along there, I'd perhaps go up to this station monument and then change onto the black line to London Bridge. And that is a perfectly reasonable path if you're a complete tourist idiot. Like the green and yellow line is shit, never get on it, right? It's the worst line ever. It's atrocious. It's slow, it breaks down all the time. So that would be, so yeah, apart from my own, you know, uh, resentment to having wasted lots of my life on that line, uh, that would be considered a high cost path through the graph, right? So if you imagine doing like a weighted graph walk, this one would be kind of like in terms of time or frustration or whatever metric you ascribe to the path, quite expensive. But I'm figuring out that the lowest cost path actually, actually is to go from Paddington to Baker Street and then go on this silver line, the Jubilee line, uh, down to London Bridge. That's the way to do it, just in case you're ever coming to visit uh, to get back at me for my crappy jokes. Yep. Uh, so if you visit, we're, we're lovely and friendly and, uh, and, uh, and so on. So, uh, no, 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 notice, I don't know what's cause and what's effect here, but the stabby part, significantly less connectivity. <laughs> now, does that include the stabbings? You know, I don't know. I mean, maybe if we were a bit more connected, we'd be so frustrated and shanking each other all the time. Uh, I do notice, though, the stabbings tend to happen on buses. So, I don't know. Um, <laughs> This is not the kind of like violent metaphor for graphs that I really wanted to project. <laughs> but anyway, let's go, let's go. So, the property graph model. So even if you knew nothing about graphs, you were just able to solve what is actually quite a sophisticated graph uh, problem. You, you probably didn't know this, perhaps, but you just solved it using something like Baxter's algorithm or the A-star algorithm, those algorithms that you were taught at university and immediately forgot uh, when, when you left school and got real jobs. Uh, <laughs> So the model that we have in, in most graph databases is called the property graph. It's a very simple but expressive model. You have nodes, and those nodes are kind of like containers for documents. And inside a node, you put properties, and properties are key value pairs. And connecting those nodes, you have relationships. And relationships are directed, they are named, and they can also contain properties. So for example, you put weights or costs up on an edge if you want to do those kind of algorithms. And using these simple uh, abstractions, you can actually build up very sophisticated models. You can model the London Tube Network very effectively. In fact, graphs are often used to model public transport. It's a very uh, 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 useful idiom for that kind of stuff. So, actually, although you come for a talk on graph theory, I have a mission which is kind of like reverse cultural imperialism. Uh, you sent us friends, this is, our, this is our shot back across your bowels. I'm going to teach you about Doctor Who. Who knows Doctor Who? Which Doctor Who? Which Doctor Who? All of them. <laughs> All of them. Good, good, good. So let me, for those of you who don't know Doctor Who, let, 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 me, let me just set the context. It is the longest running science fiction TV show in the world. In perhaps, we don't know for sure, right? Um, for example, much longer running than, what do you have here? Star Trek? <laughs> Men in the Lure? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Johnny come late as far as we're concerned. <laughs> so Doctor Who, it is uh, a universe centered around this chap uh, called the Doctor. The Doctor is a humanoid uh, uh, figure, he's not actually human. He's a, a traveller in time and space, and he goes around the universe putting right things that have gone wrong. It is completely tooled up, though, with a screwdriver with which he solves universe, universal calamities. Not selling it brilliantly now, right? <laughs> so the Doctor is from this planet Gallifrey, and that's the simplest graph we can draw. Look, Doctor from Gallifrey. Notice the direction of this relationship here. It's not Gallifrey from Doctor, it's Doctor from Gallifrey. Graphs are really readable, and now you know a piece of geek trivia that you didn't know before you came into the room, right? This is like so educational. Uh, now the Doctor uh, uh, is a bit of an impetuous Gallifrey, an impetuous Time Lord. 
And while most Gallifreyans are content to sit around watching the universe kind of drift uh, and uh, uh, sort of sedately by, uh, they have in fact invented the ability to travel in time and space. The doctor is like, well, actually, it would be far more exciting if I travelled in time and space and like had an had an adventure every week. But who'd have thought it? Every week an adventure. Uh, so what's he do? He steals a time machine. This is called a TARDIS. Uh, time and relative dimension in space. Second geek fact for you. So he steals a TARDIS, and now he can barrel around the universe, uh, uh, having adventures, putting right things that have gone wrong, and so on. And in the course of going around the universe, putting right things that have gone wrong, the Doctor starts to make enemies. Right? So it's kind of like an anti-social network. So he makes enemies of the Daleks. He makes enemies of these guys, the Cybermen. He makes enemies of these guys, the Sontarans. And this actually is a speaker landmine. So I stole this slide from my colleague Ian Robinson, who's also a Doctor Who nerd, and he put the Sontarans in, not because they're particularly popular enemies, because he says I look like one. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, fair play. Um, <laughs> is, that, is that a compliment? I can't tell. Um, I need to be shorter. That's saying I'm already short, but I can do with Lunar. Thanks, that bunch. Uh, uh, but the, it's all relative. It's all time relative. Uh, he's also quite a needy fellow, the Doctor. He, he tends to travel with companions. And up until recently, he was travelling with these guys. This is uh, Rory, and this is Amy. You see, Rory is a companion of the Doctor, and Amy is a companion of the Doctor as well. And uh, these guys have their own little thing going on, right? So uh, it tells that they love each other. Notice, Amy loves Rory. Rory loves Amy. Love can be unrequited. Oh. And you can model that in the graph. Just because Rory loves Amy doesn't mean the reciprocal is true. In this case, it's very much true. They love each other, they're married, they have a daughter, the daughter's river song. Who eventually becomes the doctor's wife? Leave me hanging, why don't you? That's great. Cheers. I'll remember that. Uh, when the Canadians invade, I'll be like, yeah? Ah, <laughs> <joke."> <laughs> And then there is the real world of Doctor Who. Don't worry, I'm not kind of just losing the plot here. Doctor Who does have a real world, right? It's the real world of the supply chain. It's the real world of the episodes that the BBC put together in a package, put on our TV sets and our DVDs. It's the real world where the actors come together with the directors and the scriptwriter and the guy who makes the coffee and sandwiches. So all these things come together in another dimension, if you like, of data, which is the supply chain and logistics stuff for, for the show. So now, even if you didn't know any Doctor Who, I could ask you questions like, in which episode did Amy battle the Daleks? And you'd be able to answer that. Not simply because this, this episode has the word Daleks in it, but because you could just follow the lines. And that's what a graph database does. It follows the lines. Except it follows the lines very, very quickly. Far more quickly than I can do with a laser pointer. On my kind of you know, uh, reasonable laptop, uh, I can get about uh, a million or so traversals per second per call. So I can explore rather a lot of graph very quickly, or I can go very deep into a graph in a reasonable kind of OLTP time frame. They're also super lovely for design. This is actually the original design of my Doctor Who data set. And in a graph database in UFJ, what you draw is what you store. You don't need to do the voodoo sacrifice of chicken to like the gods and then denormalize across 17 spindles, yada yada, oracle rack. You draw it, you store it, you query it. It's very straightforward. The domain model is highly affined to your data. Which brings us now finally to predictive analytics. <laughs> So here's this guy, Euler, who invented uh, graph theory 275 years ago. Uh, he is, to us as computer scientists and mathematicians, what Shakespeare is to students of English literature. That is, some bastard that's put in our computer science courses just to make them hard. Um, <laughs> or so I thought. So I thought. Anyway, so it turns out he invents graph theory, not just for like a lab, but he has a real world problem. He has the problem of the seven bridges of Königsberg. And the, 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 the question posed is, is it possible to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, cross each of the seven bridges of Königsberg without retracing your steps? This is the, the river Pregel. And of course, Google paid homage to that recently with its Pregel graph processing infrastructure. So what does Euler do? Well, he takes this physical problem, this noisy, messy, real-world problem, and he decomposes it into a diagrammatic version of that problem, a kind of logical representation, on top of which he then imposes a mathematical representation. In fact, what he does is the first structured systems analysis and design. He does what we do every day. Takes a messy real world problem, uh, inarticulately described to us by business stakeholders who are basically bubbling chips. Um, <laughs> and it, that's a cheap one, isn't it? But it's true. Uh, and we decompose it to some logical representation, which we typically call a design or unit test or that kind of stuff in software. And then finally, we come up 
an executable specification, which for us, in the, in the, in, uh, for the most part, is some executable software uh, for, for oil or some mathematics. And using Grand Theory, was able to determine that no, in fact, it is not possible to traverse the seven bridges of Königsberg without retracing your step. Which brings us to local properties. This guy definitely about to do a stabbing. Um, this, is, um, this is the neighbourhood where I live, in, in South East London, uh, uh, which is uh, splendid. Uh, I, I notice, I always notice, it sells English food. <laughs> what? Why would you want to do that? It's horrible! It's like the blandest cuisine on the planet. Anyway, um, so local properties. Funny thing about that is, like, things that happen in the micro are super important because they change the graph at the macro level. So this notion of a local property in the graph, and the easiest local property to get to grips with, that is one of the most profound, is the notion of triadic closure. And you have to say it in that way. It's kind of like when people talk about Haskell and they say, Morgans! Um, they do, right? I mean, it's like Harry Potter when they say that word. What triangle closure, triangle closure really means is make triangles. But if you're a mathematician, make triangles seems a bit kind of lame. So they have this fancy word, triangle closure, which is just make triangles. In a graph, particularly in graphs involving humans, there is a strong tendency to want to close off triangles. So if you look at this, right, this is, uh, this is from uh, the South Park cartoon, uh, something I, I, I'm a huge fan of. I, I, uh, I'm a huge fan of uh, the ethics of uh, Eric Cartman. Um, <laughs> uh, so here we have a, a potential little social network. Kyle, who's a friend of Stan, and Carl, who's a friend of Stan. Now, even uh, as humans now, there seems to be a tension there, right? If you've got two friends, at some point, so there is a, you know, you know, you've got a couple of mates, at some point you're going to introduce them. And because you like both those, those, those mates, those friends of yours, chances are they're going to like each other as well. So you get to close the triangle, right? So Kyle's a friend of Stan, Kyle's a friend of Kenny, Stan and Kenny become friends. Right? That seems quite nice, actually, right? That's kind of, oh, oh, good humans. Um, but equally, there's this notion of structural balance in triangle closures. So while, we, while a triangle containing three positive sentiments, three friends, is quite stable, right? That feels quite stable. Equally, we could try and close the, uh, the triangle this way. So we've got Carmen, who is somewhat ethically challenged, even for an eight-year-old boy, and he's friends with a guy called Craig, and he's an enemy of a guy called Tweak. Now, of course, we can try to close this triangle, create a triangle closure, um, by saying, well, Carmen, friend of Craig, enemy of Tweak, Craig and Tweak are friends. But this feels awkward. He even kind of, you know, uh, uh, superficially feels awkward because, like, Carl was like, say, Greg, like, hey, Greg, take that to me, tell me you're dead. Come on, Greg, that's not bad, right? Uh, and, and, like, Greg's like, well, no, actually, Greg's my friend. Uh, so don't call him a total douchebag, right? And it feels like an awkward kind of triangle. So the graph resists this. It's an, it's an unbalanced closure. Whereas actually, this is a balanced closure, where Carlton and Craig are friends, and they both dislike Tweak. I'm not saying this is a positive outcome for humankind, but it does at least feel like it's a balanced structure in the graph, right? So these two guys will now uh, gang up on this guy. Yeah, it doesn't bode well for humans as a species, does it? Okay, and of course, you know, to balance otherwise, we could go back to this nice stable structure here by having three friends. They're both stable, uh, uh, if you like, low energy uh, parts of the graph. So structural balance is a key uh, predictive technique, and what's more, it's domain agnostic, which is great, right? Graphs don't really know about, you know, schoolyard tips or that kind of stuff, but we can use them uh, to, uh, for example, think about uh, how geopolitics will evolve. So here's a retrospective predictive uh, example, right? So here we are, uh, sometime in the mid-1800s, with the, uh, the great houses of Europe. Notice you guys aren't on this map, because you're not in Europe, and frankly at that time, you were busy squabbling amongst yourselves. Right? <laughs> so here we are, the great houses of Europe. This, my friends, is the good old days. The red arrows indicate enemy relationships. The black arrows indicate allies. This is the way of things. This is the way to think. I should have put a massive weighting on it, right? So you know, now the Brits and the French share aircraft carriers. It's a bit problematic. Uh, hey, France, can we borrow the aircraft carrier next Thursday? Why? Uh, no reason. <laughs> That's awkward, right? Uh, anyway, so here are the great... The, 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 uh, and we can use this notion of, of balanced triangle closures to predict how they're going to evolve. In fact, ultimately, we're going to be able to predict how World War I starts, which is, again, yeah, win for graph theory, big loss for humankind. So here we go. 
So we've got a bunch of nodes here. Let's start to create triangles. First thing, let's bring Italy in. So we've now created a triangle, stable triangle enclosure, Austria, Germany, Italy. Notice, friend, friend, friend. Yeah, so we're already getting a bit ominous, isn't it? Like when, when, when Germany buddies up uh, with these guys, it always seems to have ended in tears. <laughs> right, so now we've got our friend relationship. We're now going to so now we've got this lapse between France and Russia, and they become our friends as well. This is not so good, right? This is kind of, this feels unstable. Right, kind of, these guys being uh, uh, friends seems to be geopolitically unstable. Then what happens? That is the weirdest thing in the history of the world. Uh, that is called the Entente Cordiale. It's a uh, document signed where the Brits said to the French, okay, let's stop kicking your asses with longbows for a few minutes. Uh, I paraphrase, right? It's written, it's written in French, which is basically in modern terms, cryptography. Uh, <laughs> Um, but this now, this feels weird, right? Because, like, weirdly, uh, France is saying, hey, Russia, you're nice. Hey, Britain, you're nice. Uh, Russia and Britain still really aren't seeing eye to eye. So that doesn't feel stable. That feels like an unstable trade enclosure. So, actually, the forces acting on the ground then make Russia and the UK into, uh, into allies. And then, if we complete uh, uh, making enclosures, just making triangles, right? That's all we're doing here. We're making triangles in the graph, and the graph naturally bifurcates into these kind of two sets of uh, 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 enemies, which all have friendships between them, and nothing but enemy relationships between them. These are all now stable trial enclosures. The graph didn't know that it was predicting the outcome of World War I, but this now is the starting condition for World War I, predicted by graph theory, which is, uh, I, I call that a staggering. So this example actually came from a phenomenal book called Networks, Cars and Markets. Uh, I encourage you all to get copy. Uh, the authors make it available free on the web uh, uh, from, from the university that they, that they work at. And, and you, can, you can buy it on Real Money at Amazon. Phenomenal book. It's aimed at undergraduate economists. So it's pitched at just the right level for kind of us lot because we can, we can get the maths enough. Uh, and uh, it's just it's, it's amazing. Uh, and they work out uh, they work it out in full in that book, uh, Easy and Climb book. Brilliant book, brilliant book. Please, please get it. Then there's this notion of strong down enclosure. So relationships uh, don't just have positive and negative sentiments, but they can have strength supplied to them. How much do I like someone? How much do I detest someone? Uh, and we can actually factor that in this notion of strong down trial enclosure. So in this case, we can have the notion of you know, Kenny, Stan, and Cartman. And uh, Kenny is friends with Stan, he's friends with Cartman. Kenny's quite a nice chap. Um, Stan and Cartman kind of get along okay. So they're still friends. Well, they're not great like friends. In fact, you know, uh, uh, you know, Stan calls him fat ass and he calls him something else. It's all, you know, it's not super, super friendly, but it's probably not an outright enemy. So it's kind of a weak friendship going on there. Now, perversely again, in the same way that these micro-level things, these kind of tri these small trident closures, affect uh, the overall structure of the graph, weak links play a much more important role in how the graph evolves than strong links. Right? It's another perversity and kind of thing that hooks me up on this graph theory stuff. Uh, because weak links tend to bridge neighborhoods, tend to bridge different communities in the graph. So you can imagine weak links will be the things that, even though you've got a beautiful tree organization on your org chart, if you've actually analyzed email traffic, you'd actually see where the teams are, who they're really collaborating with, who they're really <coughs> reporting to, who the experts are, right? Because you've noticed these bridge points between your teams, between your organizations. So in this case, we've got this, uh, again, we've, we've, in, we've got a uh, friendship graph, we've got some you know, stable trial enclosures here, and we've got this bridge between Stan and Wendy. Meaning that if the boys want to communicate with the girls, they have to go through these guys, right? Stan's the only guy that's kind of manned up enough to get a girlfriend at this point. And, uh, you know, as you're eight years old, you can't really say that you're totally friendly with a girl, because that's weird. Uh, actually, I'm 38 years old, and I still struggle with that with most guys in the group. Uh, so, so it's a weak relationship, a weak friendship relationship between Stan and Wendy, and that acts as a bridge between these communities. And noticing these weak relationships gives you opportunities to do some more kinds of analysis based on this local bridge property. Here's a picture from the 1978 American Journal of Anthropology. Right, World War, World War One, karate clubs, all sorts of good stuff. Notice already, in this uh, picture, you can see kind of two clumps emerging, right, on the left and the right. Uh, I'll give you a clue about what some of these are. So this is uh, the, the node labeled one, is the original founder and president of the University Karate Club. This guy here, node 34, is a professional instructor brought into the club as its role to help, you know, uh, uh, help the students uh, develop more. Yeah, because there were just too many students for the original founder uh, to continue with. But you can see the 
like some kind of teasing apart going on here. Something's happening. And actually, by uh, looking for local bridges, these weak links, and being able to eliminate them from the graph, you can start to tease apart the graph. So they actually uh, 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 predict how, a, in this case, how a split's going to occur. Now this is a difficult problem, this is, uh, if you want to do this properly, it's an anything hard problem, but there are statistical probabilistic methods that you can use which are far cheaper to be able to uh, 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 analyse the graph and look for these local bridges and pick them apart so that the graph starts to decompose into its constituent communities. Graph theory, if you apply this local bridge property and you pick the graph apart, you find that, it, that, that, this, uh, that this university quarter club splits in two with a bunch of people who are more connected to the original president and a bunch of people who, in their networks, are more connected to the new instructor. Now, what's really interesting about this is graph theory gets it wrong. Because actually what happened was this. See that? This node labelled 9 is much more embedded in the network around the new instructor, the professional instructor, than he is uh, around uh, the original president. However, the guy, who was a guy in this case, uh, represented by Node 9, was actually two weeks away from achieving his black belt under the original president. So when the club split in two, as it actually eventually did, Number 9 went with the original president because he was so close to achieving his goal of black belt. So the graph theory is a brilliant predictive aid, but please don't bet your children on it. Right? It's a probabilistically great method of seeing how things are going to evolve, but it's not guaranteed to be accurate. Ironically, Gartner made a prediction about this. I know this is yesterday, so I thought I'd stick this This predictive analytic stuff is going to be in the plateau of productivity within two years. And I was kind of ironically wondering how they predicted that without actually having a predictive analytics. It's kind of a chicken and egg situation. Um, anyway, so this kind of predictive analytic stuff is going mainstream in the next two years or so. Then the next thing to do is look back. Sorry, let me check my time. Let me get time. Uh, the other thing you can do with graphs, which is really nice, is look for patterns. <coughs> so, uh, in the F4J, we have this query language called Cypher, and it's about looking for patterns in data. So you can say things like, find me all of the men in my database who are due to upgrade their motor vehicle. And then you can spam them with like special offers and stuff. You effectively start looking at a high level of abstraction. Instead of like dealing with you know, traversing from one node to the next in a very imperative kind of you know, album 101 style, you start to ask the data for insight based on the fact that the data is semi-structured, there's graph data, you can use that structure to your advantage to say, find me stuff that looks like this. And we do that in the J cycle. And the second project out of the company was retail analytics, one of the big uh, UK supermarkets. So we're a bit different to you guys. So you have like you guys like privacy and stuff, and you get all upset when somebody listens to your phone calls. In the UK, we just really don't care. Like we go to a supermarket and they're like, "Do you have a loyalty card which I can use to snoop on you and build a picture of like you know, what kind of stuff you like?" And you're like, "Yeah, I do." <laughs> and like based on that, literally you'll get several dollars worth of value back over the course of your lifetime. Then <laughs> <laughs> uh, we go stand in front of the CCTV and wave at it, right? I mean, we just we just uh, we're different people. Um, anyway, so based on that. What used to happen in the old days of this you know, sophisticated uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, retail recommendation system was a bunch of data would end up in an Oracle data warehouse and you know, in just literally two days worth of processing it would figure out what vouchers to send me through the mail. At which point I would pick stuff up from the letterbox and say, oh it's spam from the supermarket and I would immediately uh, drop it in the recycle bin. Which is not a super effective way of changing my purchasing behaviour. What is a super effective way of changing uh, 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 your purchasing behaviour is the human contact. So supermarkets employ psychologists, like lots of them. That's where they all go. You think, where do all the psychologists, psychology graduates go from university? They're all in supermarkets. That's where they are. <laughs> but they learn things, and they learn that actually, as humans, when you place something in someone else's hand, you're kind of obliged to look at it, right? I know this. I, I, I worked in, in China for a long time, and I, I can't read Chinese. And it's a very business card culture in China. So someone would place a business card in my hand, and I would take it, and I would stare at the pictures. Can't read them, they've got pretty pictures, yeah, that's cool. Because we're not psychos, mostly, right? Mostly, right? Generally speaking, in this room, we, we statistically, none of us are psychos. You get the card, you look at it. Now, wouldn't it be nice, from a supermarket's point of view, is as you go through the checkout, as you go through a point of sale terminal, they print out a voucher for you, the cashier puts it in your hand, and because you're not a psycho, you take it and you read it. That is way more powerful at changing your buying behaviour than any spam emails or stuff through your letterbox or magazine adverts, adverts that you could ever, ever come up with. So we wanted to do that. 
supposed to be real-time recommendations, a very big point of sale sentiment. So, what do we do? We built a ontology. We, built a, we took a subset of the data uh, based on the classic Walmart, put beers on the end cap of the diapers aisle, and you'll sell more of both on Friday nights. We like that story. We thought we'd, we'd try it out. So we took uh, some products, a subset of the products. Uh, in this case, we took uh, beer, uh, nappies, and game consoles. Right. And uh, what we wanted to find out is, uh, we, what we found in the data was there, there was lots of people who had, lots of young men who had bought beer and nappies and game consoles. So that's an interesting buying trend. But we also found there were a bunch of young men who bought beer and nappies, but who had not bought a game console. Right? So what we, what we thought was that you know, young men, uh, young fathers, have a buying profile of beer, nappies and game console. What we didn't realise was that could also be hardcore gamers. Beer, nappies, game console. Um, <laughs> and you can't be fairly hardcore, right? I mean, if you're, if you're at that level of weird, you are like totally committed to like Call of Duty in a way that's beyond normal people. So we thought generally this would be young fathers, right? Because you're like, you grab the nappies, you grab the beers, and then you think, wouldn't it be nice if when the screaming, puking brat goes to bed, <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. He can't hear it, right? He's like 12,000 yeah, 12, kilometers away. It's all good. When he goes to bed, I just get to sit and relax, playing Call of Duty. But murdering people on screen is going to chill me right out after an evening of, like, you know, feeding and diapers and all that stuff. So we like it, we like it. So we thought, right, okay, we'll stick this in the FJ. We stuck the data in the FJ. And uh, we thought that we would look for this pattern, where someone who had a date of birth between uh, these years, who, who we think is male, uh, has bought beer, has bought nappies, and who has not bought a game console. If we can spot this pattern, we can then print out a voucher for like, hey, for the next two days, 20% off Xbox. Right? Great stuff. Now, the reason we can't pre-compute that is because there's one thing that is worse than not giving me a recommendation, it's taking the piss out of me once I've bought something. The reason you can't pre-compute, just taking the piss work here. Yeah, okay, good, no. Mm. It's nothing to do with like, you know, renal transplants or anything. It's like making a fool of me, mocking me. Sorry, that's the uh, correct English. And mocking me. So if you pre-compute that I haven't bought an Xbox, and then when I go through the checkout of my new PS3, you print me a voucher for the Xbox, that enrages me, right? <laughs> that's when I get a stabbing, right? So you can't do that pre-computation stuff. It's not helpful. You need to make those recommendations in the clickstream, if it's a web property, or in real time uh, 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 on the uh, point of sale term of hardware, uh, in this case. So we wanted this pattern. So, we took that pattern and we converted it into ASCII, right? This graph is exactly isomorphic to this graph. It just looks a bit shitter, yeah? <laughs> what I'm saying is I've got some candidate daddy here who bought something I don't really care about, which is in the, which is a, in the console category, where this candidate daddy bought something I don't particularly care about, which is in the category of nappies, and where this candidate daddy bought something I don't particularly care about in the category of beer. Right? Isomorphic to this graph. Why have I done that? Well, because if I find that out, I actually start to get something that looks a lot like Neo4j query language. In fact, if I add a match clause, it is now valid Neo4j query language. So the query has emerged from the graph structure. Now, I don't know much about SQL databases, but in my experience of them, the query never emerges from the data structure. In fact, the query is an impenetrable, no Nobel level genius thing that someone has to do to make the query match the data structure. In graphs, the queries naturally emerge because the data structure guides you. In this case, I'm now saying, in fact, here's the full, uh, full query, match where my candidate daddy bought something that's a member of the category beer, where that same candidate daddy bought something I don't particularly care about as a member of nappies, and where daddy bought something which in this case is specifically an Xbox. Notice the difference here is I've named this relationship, and I'm saying where B is not. So where that relationship does not exist, where there has not been a purchase of Xbox. Why? Because those people are the ones whose buying behavior I can influence by printing them out a voucher, posting the voucher, or whatever it may be, and return the daddy. For those of you who are deep Doctor Who fans, in my data set, it returns Rory Williams, one of the Doctor's companions. Let me hang it again. See, if I was back on home turf, there would be like a rapture of applause around here. Well done, sir. Well, also good for near real time, not hard real time. Do not run a nuclear power plant on this. But for near real time, in the clickstream kind of applications that we build every day when we build web facing systems, graph databases are a great fit. They have that minutes to milliseconds kind of performance improvement that we're often looking for. And they're not just good for social. This is a now 
vastly outdated, obfuscated list of customers of New York J. And every time someone comes to me with something new, and I'm like, wait a minute, is that? Oh yeah, it's a brand. Some case we say, yeah, data center management. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah, because things are connected to each other. The, 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 the blades are in the rack, the rack connects to the switch, the switch connects to the router, the router, yeah, the router needs air conditioning. Wow, so like analysis of why we're at data center is blown up, brilliant. Fantastic stuff. So they're really, really broad. They're not just for social stuff, although they, they did probably get an early head start on that. They're a very broad idiot. Now, freebie. Uh, two smart fellows and me uh, wrote a book for O'Reilly called Graph Data Analysis. And uh, if you come along to the Near Technology Stand, so we're at booth 29 in the exhibition area, we've got a copy for everyone. And uh, some of them have had their eBay sale value reduced because my uh, colleague asked me to sign them, but some of them are pristine. So as for a, as for a pristine one, it will, it will fetch far more on eBay. If you don't want dead, uh, dead wood, dead, dead, dead trees, then if you visit graphdatabases.com, you can download the ebook for free as well. Uh, so uh, please uh, enjoy that book. And uh, uh, one more thing, if you like graph stuff, we're hosting uh, GraphCamp 2013. Uh, San Francisco later in the year. If you use the uh, discount code DATAVERSITY, who are the guys that run this conference, you'll get 50% off uh, uh, the Graph Connect uh, entry fee. So, thank you lovely folks for listening and, and laughing at the right places. It's been a joy to be with you and uh, come and heckle me about Graph stuff anytime you like. I'll be around all day. Thank you.